Good morning, random stranger. How you going? I'm really happy you're back for more episodes of Aria the Animation. I myself have been looking forward to this because it has been a long couple of weeks and already I see Aria as that safe haven Iyashike anime I can watch to just recuperate. So hopefully you guys can also watch these reactions and just kick back to them because I think we all deserve something that gives us a break from the world every now and then. Speaking of Iyashike, I noticed a couple of you in the comments mentioned that Arya is the ultimate Iyashike and I can already see why. Queen of Autumn Sleeves, so they wrote how it's it's very healing and idealistic in the best possible way and they also gave a really cool fact about the style of music in Arya being uh, choro or choro. I don't know quite how to say it, but it's spelled C-H-O-R-O. -O. So it's a Brazilian genre of music, which I'd not heard of before. And so I looked it up on Wikipedia, as you do. And that is another fascinating rabbit hole to fall down. So it's a kind of music that uses a lot of syncopation and improvisation and it's often very happy sounding. It's perfect for Arya. And also traditional choro was, or choro was played by, with three instruments. So the flute, the guitar, and something called the cavaquinho, which looks like this mini guitar with just four strings on it. So a very chill set of instruments. Uh, so that was awesome to learn. And I'll definitely be paying a lot of attention to the music in Aria because it really plays such a huge role in making the show feel the way that it does. Also on Aria being a Yashike, so SNWH made this really interesting parallel between Aria and Girls Last Tour, which of course we finished not that long ago, and how wide of a gap there is between the two different shows despite being nominally of the same genre, Yashike. Uh, I totally agree that Girls Last Tour, despite being set in this post-civilizational wasteland where presumably all but two people in the entire world have died off, um, that that can also most definitely be considered Iyashike. So my reasoning is that Girls Last Tour, in the same way that Arya does, uses physical settings in the story to explore very introspective themes around the meaning of life and what it means to grow as a person. The external journey that the characters are taking mirrors the internal one. Uh, and in fact, the focus is way more on characters coming to certain self-realizations. And by extension, we, the audience, ask those same questions of ourselves um, and of our own lives. So, so yeah, the, the tone and setting of Arya and Girls Last Tour couldn't be more starkly contrasted and so different. But at the end of the day, both, in my opinion, like bring a sense of healing and that they aim to be artistic works that show us possible ways uh, towards becoming a better or at least a more reflective person. Uh, and in their own ways, I think they are designed to help people I guess, free themselves from Plato's cave, right? Uh, or in other words, f find different ways of thinking about our circumstances in life. And in that sense, find freedom for our souls. So yeah, that is actually something I never thought anime could be. Uh, but I've definitely been proven wrong in just like these last few shows that I've watched. Philaethus's comment made me think about how Aria will be the kind of show that makes you appreciate the all the little things in life, uh, which is something I'm really looking forward to given how much I loved shows like K-On, where there were quite a few episodes that lacked a big plot flourish, but to be honest, that was the whole charm of it, that there was nothing massively, you know, plot worthy there. It was just really about focusing on the girls' lives. So Valathus wrote, as the series goes on, I think it explores a sense that's very easily lost, a wonder and enthusiasm for day-to-day -day life. Akari has been in Space Venice, Space Venice for months, but she carries a lot of enthusiasm about what she's doing there, even if it should have been should have become rote a long time ago. I think this is not only a great way to introduce the viewers to all the facets of New Venezia, but conveys a sense of it being 
okay to love the normal everyday things around you. That's a really great point. And I think that's why I'm really getting to like Akari as the main protagonist. She's someone who knows to appreciate the little things like the sounds outside of her window when she wakes up in the morning or the sound of the coffee pot steaming. And from those little things, she seems to have this gift for drawing out deeper lessons about life and what makes it meaningful. From Iridian, there is also the tone that no good thing will last forever and things have to end in order for change and growth to happen. Somewhat like the final 12 episodes of K-On! when the girls start to really realize that their graduation means them leaving Azusa and the Light Music Club behind. In Aria, that feeling is much more prominent. That was really interesting. I mean, I'm really very much looking forward to how through Akari and her interactions with other characters, how that conveys a sense of mono no ware, like a concept I've been very slowly learning about through watching these types of Iyashike anime. Uh, that sense of impermanence, but learning to embrace the beauty of it rather than avoid or fear it and to consider your reality and to I guess inhibit the presence with your full array of senses and actually I think the whole way that Arya looks and sounds and has been designed I mean it's almost as if it's purposefully meant to heighten the viewer's awareness of what's happening in the moment with the sound design, for example, they use silence so well. Even just in the opening scene of episode one, before the OP came in, sometimes there are no other sounds except for the sound of the waves or the call of a seagull or the pushing off of the gondola off the pier. And all of those sounds work to create a sort of almost meditative state that really makes you stop and just listen and just be in the moment or in the show visually the world is stunning uh the reflection of the old buildings on the water those beautiful cracks in those buildings and what makes it even more curious is that this is a world that is full of impressive technology like those floating airships and also that telephone that akari was using that shows a hologram of the person speaking on the other end so as I've watched this show, I keep taking these like mental snapshots. Um, and actually, I'm going to do a, I guess like a tourist money shot of the episode every reaction. And I'll share it here and also in Discord. Because I guess if we can't bloody travel overseas, then this is the next best option. <laughs> so here we go. My favorite tourist snap from episode one was really just this, like the Aria Company's headquarters that blended purple and blue dawn sky and that ocean side view that just took my breath away and it immediately made me very very happy that i chosen to watch aria for episode two it was uh this shot of akari and aika discovering a neo venetian plaza in a completely new light because of the flood um i've always loved those long columned promenades and the reflection of all of that in the water was so beautiful so yeah i guess if you have any tourist shots you want to share um yeah go for it in discord other curious things i noticed uh so it's been 150 years since aqua or really mars began terraforming i think it's pretty impressive to have already a completely breathable atmosphere and this sprawling network of waterways within what is it like four to five generations because in all of if not most of the sci-fi shows that i've watched whenever mars is part of the story i'm used to seeing uh struggling settlers doing it tough and having to set up you know these massive pressurized domes that house lab grown crops that don't really taste or look that great and that never grow to scale so food scarcity and an extremely militarized society are really the dominant tropes in sci-fi from martian life but in aqua we've got these beautiful blue skies and amazing weather there are people selling veggies in local markets and these wonderful smelling food stalls and mars in aria has become this planet of water 
which I found quite refreshing actually seeing this very different, really optimistic imagined version of Mars. Regarding a uh, man home or Earth, I kind of headcanoned in that baked potato scene that maybe things back on Earth aren't really that great. Like when I says she's tried baked potatoes before, but they don't taste good. However, she does love the aqua one. So my headcanon based on nothing really and solely on wild speculation is that maybe Earth is going through this environment fallout and food supplies and other natural resources are being rapidly depleted and everything is just becoming artificial so it doesn't taste good and maybe it's a girl's last tour type situation but before humanity totally wiped themselves off the face of the planet maybe Arya is secretly the prequel to girl's last tour and all of the people actually migrated to aqua and then leaving behind she and you <laughs> All right, let's talk more about Akari as the main character. She looks and sounds a bit ditzy, but she is pretty brave for leaving home at age 15 to start a new career in a completely foreign world. And maybe it's normal in that universe, but I still find it very impressive. I also like that she's so giving and so generous. Uh, in the first episode, for example, I isn't exactly warm and friendly <laughs> at first, but Akari still wants to help her have the best experience possible of New Venezia and that really touches Ai so much so that they end up becoming pen pals and I would like to ride in Akari's gondola next time she returns. So Akari's secret weapon I think is that she kills people with kindness and that gives her an emotional depth I find very intriguing um, and I, I really liked this perspective from let's see, Jose Valerio about kind characters in general. So somewhere along the line, we have been taught that characters who are bright, smile all the time and are generally kind should be derided as bad. Yet if you think about it, we don't really question other seemingly one note characters if they're brooding, cynical, or even just somber. It's a reactionary strain of thought to be instantly suspicious of happiness and kindness, especially when packaged in corporate backed hyper realistic products. That's very real. <laughs> but perhaps we are conflating optimism and kind heartedness with innocence and naivete. Yeah, this comment really made me think. So we have characters in Aria like Akari and Alicia who are genuinely 100% kind and who will potentially remain kind throughout the entire series. I don't know, but I suspect that's the case. But that doesn't make them any less complex as characters. I do have to admit like that whenever I've come across these characters in other shows, uh, this red flag pops up because I'm like, are they going to be just really flat, boring characters who are just nice, but they're going to have zero character growth? Or are they there just to be the dumb character or the naive character? Or maybe their kindness is like this superficial front. But on rewatching Arya, like it's clear to me that, and I know it's only been two episodes, but it is sort of clear to me that Akari and Alicia don't really fall into either of those categories. You know, Akari genuinely loves Aqua and New Venezia, but she also mentions that it has its inconveniences. Like life is super slow, the whole city floods once a year. She's very clear-eyed also that um, about how much work it took for the city to even be built. Like it was built by sheer willpower on a world without water and without air that this whole city as she puts it is made up of all of these miracles so Akari isn't ignorant about the hard work it takes to make something wonderful to happen so she's definitely not naive in that sense and she sees that difficulty and the challenge and appreciates the city even more because of it also that clarity of hers about hard work I think it parallels both her own journey uh, to work hard to become a prima undine as well as her approach to human relationships you know relationships also take quite a bit of work and Akari isn't afraid of that 
also in episode one, for example, you know, when Akari meets Ai and the relationship starts off with Ai literally blackmailing her with, if you don't become my friend, I'm going to scream. So often, often we don't control the situation that we meet others. And sometimes relationships don't really get off to a great start, but we can take it from there and work on it and develop that relationship or that friendship like a cutie did uh it's hard work because humans often aren't great at understanding each other but it is still worth it to, to quote alicia you know once you put in the work the person that you love uh ends up becoming someone that you actually really treasure I like to think of Akari's ability to row the gondola backwards as a kind of superpower that parallels her other superpower, which is being able to make friends under any circumstance. Because rowing backwards to most people seems like such a useless skill to have, especially in the gondola business, you know, you're not going to be rowing customers backwards. But in certain situations, for example, like when you have a cat president you have to save, it can be a huge advantage. So just like being good at rowing backwards, being always genuinely kind and open-hearted all the time, you know, can be seen as a bit useless or as a weakness. It opens you up to being taken advantage of. But really, kindness is Akari's secret weapon. By being so open and so accepting of others, it brings her a lot of good as well in the form of new friends and new lessons learned about life. Akari really is the type to take risks. So during the Aqua Alta, the flood, when everyone stays home, she decides to go exploring and then ends up getting lost because everything looks different with the flood. But her attitude is, you know, if we do things differently on this different kind of day, maybe we'll discover something new. So she's always looking on the bright side. And whether it's rediscovering a different corner of the city or finding a new person to befriend, Akari is or tends to be rewarded for taking risks and being unafraid of new and, I guess, unusual situations. I think Akari also takes after Alicia in the way that she can read others' true intentions. Her insight at the end of episode one into Ai's purpose for coming to New Venezia uh, was pretty impressive. Basically, Ai came to New Venezia because she wanted to understand her sister and her sister's love for the sea more. So she took that extra step to understand, even if it was begrudgingly and despite saying how much she hated the city. But she was open enough to change her mind and also, I guess, lucky enough to come across Akari and Aika who were able to show her a different side of the city. Since we're talking about Alicia, Alicia is both kind and a super badass. I cannot believe the voice actor for Alicia was also the voice of Ozen from Made in Abyss. (laughs) That blew my mind learning that. Who was it that told me that? Oliver Yayato, yeah. Thank you so much, mate, for just giving me a solid moment of disorientation at that fact. Uh, I kept trying to imagine Ozen doing the ara ara, and I just could not. It was insane. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I totally understand why everyone loves Alicia so much and just can't stop talking about her once they meet her. She pulled out some pro moves to save uh, Arya Shacho, or well smiling and being so apologetic to her customers who are super impressed with her she also and i think more importantly has this very deep empathy and understanding of humans and their very complicated relationships like she doesn't push her views onto others either for example in episode two she doesn't say anything much when Aika asks her to join the Aria company but she does see straight through Aika's ranting about how mean Akira is and all she does is she simply states you know yes Akira is tough but she's also a very kind person too and Aika you know that don't you which makes Aika speechless because Alicia has hit the nail on the head. You know, to be able to see through people like that, like their glass, is a skill that should never be underestimated and actually should be feared. <laughs> we might as well cover the other two Undines that we've met and mentioned already. So there's Aika, who is assertive, brash, 
and competitive, but also surprisingly perceptive. She doesn't hesitate to call a kid she doesn't even know a freeloader to their face. (laughs) So she's a straight shooter, which I really appreciate. She is allergic to sappy lines, but she's also not above saying them herself on the rare occasion because she too has this softer, um, introspective side. And even though she appears confident, there are still some underlying insecurities regarding her position as the sole heiress of the Himea company. The way she fights to prove herself the better Undine suggests that, well, that she still feels like she has to prove herself to not just Akira, but also to the world. So even in just these two episodes, we've been presented with several dimensions of inner conflict within Aika that belie a character who is still struggling to solidify an identity for themselves. Well, that's being a teenager, right? It feels like she's not figured out whether she wants to break away from the strictures and the expectations that come with being the Humea heiress or whether she wants to actually fulfill them. So yeah, Aika I find to be a, a super interesting character with lots of different I guess, layers to her. Akira, the way she was introduced immediately highlighted her commanding presence and her no-nonsense, extremely strict attitude towards Aika. The first time she met Akari, she calls her the other half of the Manzai Act and then later threatens to drown the girls in the new Adriatic Sea if they don't come down within 10 seconds. So she is a bit of a prickly pear. The way she deals with conflict is to be like, Let's fight it out right here, right now. Tell me what you hate about me and I'll prove you wrong. Even her voice is perfectly cast for that. Like it's the direct opposite of Alicia's softer, I guess higher, gentler tones. She has a more solid voice in the deeper register and it has an edge when she snaps at people. But interestingly, just like Aika, she has these nuances to her character that I love the story to dig into more. The way she talks about Aika when Aika is not actually around was really telling. Like her voice goes a bit softer and she tells Alicia, you know, that Aika isn't like herself at all. And she says that like it's a good thing. She was like, unlike me, Aika isn't crude or rebellious. And But she would never tell Aika that though. (laughs) Which is why the fireworks between Aika and Akira are so interesting to watch. You have two people who really struggle to say things as they feel them and who express their affection and care for the people they care about, sometimes in an extremely indirect way. For example, the way Akira designed the race with Akari was really a way to give Aika the freedom of choice to return to Himeya or not. At this stage, Uh, Akira either knows Aika is better than Akari at forward paddling or she knows that Akari won't have the heart to really try to win and therefore be the cause of Aika's departure. So the only way that Aika would lose and therefore return to Himeya would be if she chose to lose and not because of any superiority on Akari's part, who, by the way, was a total innocent bystander in all of this. I also love that Aika knew that Akira was giving her a choice. And deep down, she knows Akira is one of the very few people who will be straight with her and not go easy on her because she's the Himea heir parent. And that's the only way that she'll improve and become the best Undine that she can be if she has a mentor who won't coddle her or bend to her family's reputation. Meanwhile, Akari is the only one who's clueless about what Akira's true intentions were with the race but by the end of it all she catches on you know she is slower about it though which is why she expresses that hope that one day she'll be able to see the things that lie beneath the surface of people just like Alicia can. The relationship dynamic I find most intriguing is the one between Akira and Alicia. There is a long-term rivalry there and maybe even a sense of being overshadowed on Akira's part She seems to have these insecurities that stem from a number of things, like Alicia becoming a prima undine before her, being supposedly like more physically attractive than her, 
maybe even the fact that her trainee Aika was inspired to become an Undine because of Alicia too and not because of her like at the end of episode two she expresses a little bit of uncertainty over whether Aika will actually really try to win the race because of how much she idolizes Alicia or how much she hates training under Akira. I mean, Akira is even prepared to speak to the company on Aika's behalf if that had actually happened. And I feel like, I mean, at some point, these insecurities might have been a huge deal for Akira. But I think because she and Alicia have both reached the top of their game and sort of reign at the pinnacle of the Undin hierarchy together, I think Akira must have reached some semblance of peace within itself a while ago about, I guess, sharing the spotlight or even giving it up to Alicia. Because despite being business rivals, their friendship is very easy and very obvious. Like, Akira might berate Alicia for interfering and being too nice with her trainee, kind of like, this is my kid and you need to butt out and mind your own business. But Alicia has a great time trolling Akira with her like coy smiles and her ada adas. And I actually love that there appears to be there appears to be more to Alicia than just being nice. She is a bit of a troll. And after all that teasing, Alicia is like, Well, would you like some tea? And then Akira just shrugs and goes, Yeah, sure. So their friendship is everything. Last thing, I'm really curious to meet this as yet unrevealed great Undine, the third one. Uh, her name is Athena of Orange Planet. And also, I was trying to come up with theories around how the three Undines became the three great fairies of Nirvanatsia. So there's three theories at the moment, and I've ruled none of them out. Option A, so there was some huge Undine competition uh, or maybe one that's held every year or every couple of years and the three of them kept coming out on top to the point where they were inducted into the Hall of Fame and they're basically untouchable now. That's option A. So option B is there is actually a dark underbelly of Nia Venezia behind all of the smiles and the sunshine and the baked potatoes. And there was once this huge fight to the death amongst all of the Undine companies. And the only three who survived that street war were the Aria Company, Himea, and Orange Planet, who now hold a monopoly on the gondola business. Kind of like the way that Sicilian gangs took over the south of Italy for a time. And if that theory turns out to be true, I mean, Alicia is even more badass than I ever imagined. Because I think it's literally her and Akari in the Aria company. Uh, there was one more option. So option C, I guess the way they became the three great Undines is that they each have their own special Undine technique that sort of forms part of the prestige and even the mythology of Nia Venezia. Uh, this one is probably the more realistic one. So Alicia's special draw, I guess, is her extreme competence and her grace, and her ada adas. At first, I would have said that it's probably, you know, having this really um, serene grace that makes you one of the great Undines, but <laughs> having met Akira, I mean, she's clearly very competent and takes care of her customers, but given the huge personality contrast between Alicia and Akira, and serene grace is not a phrase I would associate with Akira, there is obviously some other X factor that makes her and the other two great Undines. All right, so guys, I had to change rooms because it was so noisy outside. But yeah, it's time to settle in and grab your favorite drink. I've got my coffee here or whatever drink makes you happy. And let's uh, dive back into Aria episode three. Okay, you ready? Let's go in three, two, one. Hmm. Alice Chun. <sighs> I immediately feel better. I love dipping my hand in the river or the water like that. Shh. 
Yeah, I'm really digging that we get these like scenery journeys for every OP. And every time it's different. Oh, really up in the Undine training game. I love those little bridges, like Venetian bridges. <sighs> it's my favorite part of the whole OP. When it just soars like that. Ah, with the view and the sweeping cliffs. Those birds are a bit weird though, aren't they? <laughs> kind of not really going anywhere. I love her face when it goes like that. A super ditzy face. So there's singles. Pairs. Okay. There's a hierarchy. Pairs, singles. Undine. Prima Undine. Oh, the third girl. So she's a prodigy of some sort. Oh, she's a, like a social recluse. Extremely talented, but lonely. Oh, nice. So we get one each from the trainees. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that was a great nani. Ah, oh, look at that painting. It's like that's stunning. Ah, oh, Cuddy, she's like, be my friend. At least Alice is a relatively easier name to remember. <laughs> oh, young. So it's 14, 15, and 16. Ike is the oldest. <laughs> How competitive she is. Aggressive competitiveness. <laughs> and Arkady is just like, oh, let's bet some flowers. I do love these contrast of personalities. I think they got the balance really right. Oh, and she's like, so that's what human friendship is like. <laughs> she is pretty sappy, I gotta say. But, you know, it's a strength. <laughs> she is indomitable. Hmm, I think there's something more going on beneath the surface. Oh, wow, the up and coming new starts.
I guess Humea would be the one, one of the companies that's like been around for ages, centuries even. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so she, I guess she Akari replaced someone. Maybe there's another girl before her. Oh, she's she's a cutie that doesn't really know how to interact with people. And I guess a huge part of being an Undine is being able to make people feel comfortable and at ease. That's probably the part where she struggles. Technique-wise, she's amazing. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Cover girl. Of course she is. Wow. This is amazing. It's like they start them real young and they scout people. Hmm. The Akari has nothing but admiration. <laughs> For Aiko, it's like. I gotta tear this girl down, <laughs> show her what I've got. They make it look so sad. She does stick out with that green hair too. Oh my gosh, she's a celebrity. Well, I guess she was in the magazine. Hmm. So she's not exactly full of herself. No, she just hates people. <laughs> what is smile? Cannot compute. <laughs> she has a friend though, like she's not totally useless at human interaction. Oh. Like I don't think she didn't sign because she wanted to be mean or she thought she was above the other girls. She just doesn't know what to do with people. It's really hard. <laughs> just smiling at herself. Just practicing. <laughs> oh, girl. <sighs> I feel her though. Society, hey? Society is hard. Mm. She wants genuineness. I guess that would be Akari's secret weapon, like an expression of that. Her just genuineness just overflows out of her. So she makes people know that, you know, she is genuinely being nice to them or genuinely wants the best for them. <laughs> maybe that's why alicia hired her to like the only girl that she hired because she's like yep that girl could take my place <gasps> oh. <laughs> just grab people's hair like that Oh.
Oh my gosh. <laughs> Alicia would not be attracted to that. Come on. He's so mean to her. Huh? Oh, he works in the... Oh, that's like a city on top of a conch shell that's floating. <laughs> that old line. That looks like St. Mark's Square. <gasps> Is she going to go and rescue her? <laughs> She's like, who's that asshole giving her a hard time? <gasps> oh, girl. Oh, my gosh. She's got an awe. <laughs> I love her so much. Good on her. Or at the ready. Is this how she shows affection? Can't say no to that smile. <laughs> How the turns have tabled. Oh. <gasps> oh, that's so mean. That's so cool. Just such an old, you know, enlightenment era building. And then there's this massive spaceship that comes out of it. <laughs> he seems to be a nice enough guy. I mean, he's letting the president, like, take a ride on his head. It was St. Mark Square. <laughs> Invention of cafe on there. Oh, she has an incredibly strong sense of justice. I like that. Right, it's symbol of Mark. Right? Yeah. Oh, I love how we get the tour as well. <laughs> oh no. Ironically, well, I was going to say, like what Alice does, <laughs> protecting the peace. Wow. It all takes place off in that one, like, workstation. How? I don't think they're going into the technical details of how exactly they regulate the entire planet's atmosphere. I hope they do, but it doesn't matter if they don't. <laughs> 
Ah, the ego. He's like wearing something weird underneath his jacket. It's sort of like a turtleneck, a sleeveless turtleneck of some type. <laughs> Is it the murmuring of the crowd in the background? She's a people watcher. What? What is that? <laughs> is that like an, a little alien? A little egg alien? <laughs> oh, but that's her thing though. She kind of notices all the little things. Blushing. Ah, oh, look at Akari just getting into people's hearts left, right, and center. Last time it was I, now it's Alice. That's a great shot. Oh my gosh. <laughs> His boss. <laughs> oh no. Looks like a very, like a banker type. <laughs> I mean, maybe runs the Medici bank or something. I find Undine on the land as well. <sighs> yeah, that's what we were talking about, right? It's a secret weapon. Hmm. Open your heart. Oh. She's learning already how to open up to people. Well, who best to teach that than Akadi? <laughs> Momiko. <gasps> yeah. Ukijima. Oh my goodness, what a ride. That would be the most amazing cable car ride ever. Loving this piano and violin background music. It's so soft and warm. Ah, look at that light shining through. 
So I'm going to watch the sunset from here. <laughs> that was an interesting shot. Wow. <laughs> oh, look at the design of those buildings. Bird symbolism is very heavy throughout. <laughs> Sappy line. She's like, girl, you speak in my language. That's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> My chest is filled with the smell of salt. Oh, it looks amazing in, at night time. That was a great episode. I love that they're building out the world of Nia Venezia. Uh, it was really good to see that what the island up in the sky was actually. And surprisingly, they are responsible for like the survival of the entire species on, on Aqua. <laughs> Um, yeah, we got introduced to Alice, whom I really love. Yes, she's not, she doesn't start out so great, uh, in terms of relating to people and I guess, uh, opening up herself to them, but she does have a very strong sense of justice and of wanting to do the right thing and also she shares with Akari this desire to become the best Undine that she can be. I do so I said I love that they have the balance of the three girls so Akari is super passionate super open and kind maybe not the best Undine you know technically she's not as polished as as maybe uh, Aika or you know Alice but she's got the heart and then Alice is like got all of the technique and she's just naturally gifted and has been from a very young age but she doesn't have Akari's uh, openness with people and the ability to make them feel like she's genuine and then I guess Aika she brings the fire you know to the trio she's super competitive she will fight you know, and scrap to the nail to get to the top. So the interaction between those three already, I think is going to be really, really interesting. And of course, Akari is like the heart of the group. I don't know. I guess it's only just them three because there's three companies and then there's the three trainees. So really, we just have to meet Athena, who I'm assuming is um, Alice's teacher. Okay, episode four. Let's uh, go in three. Two, one, play. <laughs> I was thinking Discord. <laughs> oh, that's such a great shot too. Just going into the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, so they're all hanging out, all three of them now. That was quick. <laughs> oh my gosh, what a life. I mean, every day just being able to row around this awesome city. Oh, 
<gasps> That's probably the most stressful moment so far in this show. Well. Fire watches. Sylphs. Interesting use of word. I don't know what that word might come from. <laughs> well, that's one way to look at the postal service. Oh my god. That's. Uh, these views. Like, yes, the. the animation and the designs aren't super sharp and it, you can tell the age of this anime but it really doesn't matter like it doesn't impede on just the feeling you get when you're immersed in this world oh i love the details of where the oars go i thought alicia doesn't live there but it seems like she does. Maybe it's just because when uh, Aika stayed over, she had to give up her room or something. It's a really small detail, but it's it's so cute that where the butthole is, I just draw like an X. <laughs> oh man, I want to go here so badly. Just retire here. So they've pretty much got everything that Earth has, probably better. Like a clock tower. It's a pretty packed and lively city. Ooh, going back into a dark tunnel, it's sort of like the opposite of the very opening scene. Is this going to be a horror episode? Yeah, it's so immediately noticeable when we get into the darker tones. And there's like all shadows and stuff because most of the show is like pastel, sunlight, blue skies. So narrow, those alleyways. Is that a little devil child? <laughs> Are they real? Why would they wear a bell around their neck? It's a little bit scary. <gasps> Don't, that's the devil's deal. <laughs> Is she going to sell a soul? This is me, the cynic, talking. There's probably nothing shady going on here. <laughs> it's 
such a bizarre encounter. Oh, we've seen him before. He's like waving in the first episode. A data card. Hmm. Hmm. That's, uh, I don't know what the bell is meant to signify. She didn't hear it, only the cat heard it? Is this some kind of, I don't know. Something weird's going on. Did they just travel into some other world? <laughs> oh. The music, like just the, this style of music is making me feel like Something sci-fi is happening. There's something off about this kid. Beyond time and space. <gasps> I feel like they're being lured into an alternate dimension. <laughs> the beyond space and time thing was like a big hint. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, Alicia the Troll. So maybe it is a place that used to exist in the past. Oh man, that's so cool. Maybe there's time travel in this show. That would be so awesome. Like there are these portals you can go through to step back in time. Oh. 
Like the OG settlers. So that kid is like maybe some kind of spirit. They're stuck in this world and they need someone to help them find their way back to the past. It kind of looked like the island in Hoseki no Kuni, <laughs> like the shape, the crescent shape. Oh, is she going to get him to fly her there? <laughs> Gourmet cat food. His oh, name is Woody. Well, at least she won't be going alone. Was that hinting at some sort of like business difficulties? We're worried for her. <laughs> it always looks on the bright side. Like suspicion is not Akari's first instinct. It's and it's endearing, but also a bit worrying. Oh, Aika being a mom. <laughs> That's how she's gonna fly all the way out there. Oh man. Ugh. I feel like he should at least strap her in somehow. <laughs> That's nuts. <laughs> I mean, that would be an amazing experience, but also, like, I'd be freaking out so bad. Swimming in the sky. <laughs> There's no such thing as air pressure. <laughs> oh, that's it. Oh, it's okay. It's just a pit stop. Does he think about it like that? <laughs> Doesn't look like it. He's <laughs> just thinking about the profit line. It's just the bottom line, that's what matters. You're sort of like carrying their experiences, yeah. Oh, 
that's nice of him. What I didn't read what it said on the side of his vehicle, like Roman or something. I guess it's Mars, so yeah. I can't believe it either. <laughs> I'm half expecting like Foss or some gems to be running around. Just nothing but ruins, yeah. Oh, that's not a graveyard, is it? Wait. Oh, <gasps> like Atlantis. <laughs> Maybe they're not here anymore because the city sank into the ocean. <laughs> The letter is to someone who's dead, isn't it? <gasps> You're kidding! She rides too? <sighs> yeah, Alicia is perfect. <laughs> it's got like a flat sunflower on the bike. And she flew all the way over just to tell her. Hmm. Oh. Maybe she is a ghost herself. Now oh, this turned out unexpectedly sad. That's so cute. Oh. It's like a, it's not a credit card. Oh, it's USB, I guess. Oh, man. Kind of looks like the girl who gave this letter to Akari. It's the same eyes. Uh, 
Ami. The, it was the cat. What? It was the eyes and the bell. Ami is the cat. Yeah, because that's the same place with the windmills. So they were ghosts. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, it's like such an unexpected emotional moment. They they built that up really well from the start of the episode, creating the mystery of, of the little kid with the bell uh, on their collar. It doesn't offer any solid answers, like how did this building appear that no longer exists and why doesn't the alleyway, the alleyway exist anymore, like the one that Akari went through to find the little girl with the letter. Clearly there is something mysterious going on or there's some spiritual powers in the city still at work. Like maybe there are all these spirits wandering near Venezia, like the one, the pioneers, right? All of these um, souls with unfinished business and they're just waiting for someone who's alive today to sort of untie this emotional knot that they've been holding on to for 150 years or something. Oh, wow. Oh, beach episode next. <laughs> yeah, anyway, I love that episode. I Man, okay, so this is the fourth episode and already I'm just... If every episode was sort of like this episodic and has just a simple message or not simple but just a an impactful or sentimental message that it wants to convey, then I'd be pretty happy, like... It doesn't have to be a major intricate plot line, you know, it's just nice to be able to sit in these really heartfelt storylines and kind of just reflect on, again, what really matters in life. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed those episodes. I feel more at peace with the world now and I'm so grateful that a bunch of people decided to get together and make Aria because I feel like they gifted the world with uh, a really unique way to relax and just appreciate the general wholesomeness of a piece of art. So some quick thoughts to finish off. The big thing in episode three, of course, was that we met Alice. And I know I kept saying that she's not as adept at being open to others as Akari, but that's not to say that she doesn't want to be and doesn't want to learn how to. She clearly has a desire to reach out to other people and get on friendly terms with them. Case in point, she went as far as to practice that beautiful smile of hers uh, in the reflection of the fountain. I guess what she doesn't want, though, is to be friendly at the expense of being untrue to herself. Like, she doesn't want to have to fake smile or fake care for customers, even though that is the universal standard in the Undine business. You know, it's it seems Alice is actually quite 
worldly wise in the sense that she realizes most undines are probably just in this business as a job you know they're not 100% invested in the happiness and the joy of their customer I mean of course they care about that but that's not the only thing they care about there are other things like you know profits to worry about their performance isn't just all about ensuring people create happy memories but it's also about yeah the money and feeding into the prestige of whatever particular undine company that they work for and that's completely fine you know imagine expecting uh people who work in services or retail to be always genuinely happy to serve you know all the time and only wanting to make customers happy i mean some people are like that and that's fine too but as i said in the first reaction you know not everyone is an akari which is what draws uh alice to akari because she senses that akari is really different in her attitude and in her values to all the other undines that she knows so alice reaching out to akari uh when she thought akatsuki was harassing her was one of my favorite moments it was her way of reaching out and of showing that she does and can care for people and isn't purposefully trying to be like a cold distant person and on that uh just some personal reflection it's not bad being someone who prefers alone time or finds it tiring to keep up an appearance for the sake of making friends or or making others comfortable uh extreme introversion is an actual thing and you should never ever feel ashamed of it if that is you know how you are it's more a matter of uh finding ways to challenge yourself one of which might be stepping outside of your comfort zone every now and then to meet someone or to start up a conversation and um you do that not to satisfy society's expectations of what a normal person should be like because screw that but because you never know what might come your way like for example what lifelong friend you might gain or what new things you might learn about yourself So I'm very very proud of Alice for taking that step uh, and clearly she's now been let into this trio of undine singles well she's not a single she's still a pair but trainees who can support each other and chill together and just tease each other so yeah it really worked out well for her other things we learned are Akatsuki totally giving off the annoying older brother vibes in relation to Akari but he too had a surprising moment of clarity uh when Alice was threatening to bonk him with her or for uh harassing Akari and was going to report him to the gondola association or something he's not phased at all and immediately recognizes that this is a teenage girl trying to reach out to a new friend and that that is her way of expressing concern and care so that was a surprisingly perceptive moment from him and it kind of catches um Alice off guard too and i love when that happens and it's happened a few times already in these past few episodes when you can see a a light bulb switch on in the mind of the characters and you're watching them have this moment of self-realization and of personal growth one last thing we know now that orange planet has only been in operation for 10 years and yet they shot to the top of the undine company rankings and possibly will overtake himea who i assumed is a much more established company with a long illustrious history so it's going to be interesting to see whether they will uh bring more of those interrelations or the competition between the undine companies into the story or if it is just going to remain as a as a background fact that sets up for these three girls to keep developing their friendships with each other episode 4 was uh just a heartfelt mystery turned inspirational story i mean not inspirational i guess just touching story We learn something new and interesting about Neo Venezia which is that it is a city where supernatural things happen where an entire alleyway and a building can appear or disappear and where cats can turn into human form and interact with 
the humans of New Venezia to help them uh Liu get some see. So oh my god, my English just totally evaporated in my brain. I guess it's a, it's a city where cat spirits can ask humans to resolve the unfinished business of the heart, I guess is how you would translate that. So Akari's discovery that the letter was actually addressed to an old pioneer base that no longer exists really and where everyone has already passed on was quite emotional. The pulling of the heartstrings when you realize it's actually a video message from a wife to her husband talking about how she hopes to see him soon and that the water his settlement is working on digging out will eventually flow back to where she's living right now. But actually it turned out that he probably died in an accident. Like, so that was an unexpected direction that that episode took. And again, it, uh, it hints at the fact that it wasn't always that in Aqua or near Venezia, everything was all bright and rosy. It took a lot of human sacrifice to make it so that this city would thrive. Uh, yeah, so it's just so real. Um, I guess the other part of that message is that people often don't get to say what they want to say to their loved ones before an unforeseen accident or a tragedy befalls them and takes them away. And so often it's that lack of closure that causes so much pain for people so to see in this story that eventually Akari was able to help deliver that final message or those feelings and help the souls of those people to find rest that was really touching that's another aria reaction done guys I hope that whatever is happening in your lives that you still have the time to just relax and rest and do what you enjoy because that's so important and yeah have a good rest of the week and I will see you for the next reaction